I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Exposure 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Now remember, given the payday, as you've been accounted for, okay? 610B, that was the main date, 610B. I'm out here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows fences below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all here. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary stretches are underway. Hey, welcome back to Old School. I'm Rick Lasky, along with my buddy, John Salka. And, hey, buddy, we, we've talked about, uh, uh, and I, I know we wanted to talk about this particular topic today, but... Uh, you, you and I have talked about this in, in class, but a couple a couple of our different shows in the past. And I know years and years ago we talked about it and uh, got a lot of great feedback from a lot of great people. But yeah, how about we spend just this this particular episode of Old School talking about the alarm office, the dispatch center, um, the importance of, of those that work there um, and, and what they mean to us, especially those in the field. Um, and I won't get to it right now. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But there have been firefighters' lives who have been saved because a dispatcher calls, you know, command to, command to, to uh, you know, dispatch, blah, 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 so, so forth. They run under fire. All of a sudden you hear dispatch to command. Go ahead. Uh, you've got an emergency. You've got a mayday. Sounds like something. Because, you know, with everything going on, you, you know, right. we teach our mayday class, right? You may only have one time to hear that call for help or mayday. And if you missed it, headsets or not, as it happens, you know, if you missed it, Man, having them sitting on your shoulder going, hey, Chief, I think I heard something called for help is huge, isn't it? Right. It certainly is. And, and I've seen dispatchers get involved in stuff like that. I've seen dispatchers like when we had guys hurt, seriously hurt, you know, like dispatchers on the radio coordinating. Okay, I got NYPD blocking off, you know, Metropolitan Avenue. You guys are clear all the way to New York, right to the hospital. You can get that ambulance straight through there. And, you know, they just jump in and they are helpful on everything. They get, They really are communication experts, you know. Well, and you know, like everywhere, like in our in our fire business, there there are it's littered with incredible incredible firefighters and officers. And every now and then, every now and then, out of almost you know forty thousand departments in the United States and, and 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 a ton more up with our brothers and sisters in Canada, every now and then we get a dud. And the same thing with dispatch. Every now and then they get some, or maybe someone who's not into the job as much, or or they just got into it. And they don't know any better. Like we have some firefighters that are into the job, but John. Talk briefly about the difference between the, the the alarm operators that you can tell are into it, or those that are just in there pushing buttons. Big difference in there, right? And, and you know, and there is. And, and I remember over the years when I was on the job, when I was a lieutenant, when I was a captain. I'm not sure it didn't happen too many times when I was a battalion chief, but I. But but then sometimes you get people that get hired, just ordinary folks, no accents, no problems like that. But you can just hear them on the radio, you know. Bronx to the one eight, yeah, ten four, this that, and and there's really not a lot of gumption. There's really not a lot of interest. You can almost tell in the radio. Now anybody can be distracted. Anybody can have stuff going on. Maybe the guy who's having a bad day, like everybody else does once in a while. But but then you compare that to, to the guys and the gals that know everything that's going on. They know everybody that's working, and I mean, and they really do. They they look at the sheet like I look at the sheet. They see all the chiefs. They see what the company officers are, and they know half of them because half of them are guys that are into the job, that got kids on the job or their dad was on the job. And like I said, Herb Iza was a guy I knew from Manhattan in my early days. He was a dispatcher 124. Why was he dispatcher 124? Because his brother, the captain of six truck, George Iza, was in 124 truck as a lieutenant. So when Herb got on a job, he took 124. He was well known as dispatcher 124 is Herb Iza. There's all those little connections between people on the job and people that are dispatchers and people that are fire officers. And it was just, I, I'm lucky that I sort of, I don't know what the word is. I, I made a connection with that, with the guys that I was on the job with, knew a lot of dispatchers. There are guys on the job that don't even know where dispatchers work. They don't even know where the CO is, the, the, the communications office. I feel fortunate that early in my career, I got to know some people that knew dispatchers and I started paying attention to that because it's a, it's a whole element of the job. And I think this is true everywhere. It's almost invisible. The dispatchers are almost invisible unless you start to get to know them 
or unless you make it a point to, to go see what they're doing, most guys pay no attention to it. It's just a voice on the radio, and then we go to a fire, and then we talk about what we do the rest of the day. Well, and, and exactly, and, and we talked about this before, about uh, many times before, about those that lack passion for what they do suck. You can't be great at anything you don't love to do. It doesn't, I don't even give it very good. However, you know, when you've got someone in the alarm office, just like someone on a job, a firefighter who's into the job, man, a young firefighter that comes in and golly, man, they are just, I mean, they're just full of energy. They just love being there. It's a, they're, they're feeling blessed. They're just, you know, same thing in dispatch. You know, when you've got those that are in there and, and we've talked about it before, you've heard me brag about, well, um, uh, back, you know, April's always um, a national public safety telecommunicators week. And um, I, I had some guests on one of my hump day hangouts that, you know, we've done, you've been on there before me and Terry McGrath. And we had, uh, let me see, Angela Sherrod uh, from Louisville, Texas, Kelly Haney from Grapevine, Texas, and uh, Felicity Franklin from Denton County uh, Sheriff's Office of Texas. Three great, great dispatchers. And we spent the hour talking about dispatch and, you know, and we talked about their careers and about other people. And all three of them, those three represent the finest in the alarm office. And, and uh, I do have to tell this story uh, for our listeners. Stan Stedman was also one of my favorites in Louisville. He retired. Um, he's back, he's back working. He's back working, I think in Grand Prairie, Texas, but, uh, uh, Stan was just, he was another one. He was one of our chaplains. He was, he was into the job. Um, but, but Stan, uh, his last day with, well, there's 20 or 25 years at a job, his last day, everybody's come up to see him. There's cake in the alarm office, big alarm office there in Louisville. And, and it just so happened again for our listeners here that John, John, you know, Chief Salka was down there. Uh, I think he was teaching or doing something. So he was hanging with us for the day. And, um, he was riding with me. He and I were chasing calls in a buggy. And uh, every time I'd clear, I'd, I'd, I'd go, you know, Louisville from Chief One. God, Chief One and the, and the 18th Battalion are clear. And, and, he'd, and Stan would say, Chief One, 61 and Battalion, 18, you're clear. So right before he got off at 3 o'clock, I had John clear us. And John's like, no, nah, no. Nah. I said, no, come on, please do it for me. It'll just be fun. And, and John, I never – I really at the moment – didn't realize the impact. We were just having fun. I just wanted you to talk to him. And you, you, you cleared us on the radio. And he answered. He said, he said, Chief, Chief One and the, the one eight Battalion are clear. And everybody that was up there at the time in the alarm office wishing him well and having cake and visit, he all said he got emotional. And he said, I can't believe I, on my last day, what a gift. I got to talk to a battalion chief, especially Chief Salka from, from the Bronx on Louisville's channel. And again, you know, if, if you're a firefighter and, and you don't understand and understand that, you will one day. That's that that's like that's like hanging out with the guys in Rescue One in New York or Rescue Three or Squad Five in Chicago, and having them recognize you for what you do. John, I'll never forget that. That was just such a great gesture, such a cool thing, and he loved it. He was all fired up about it, you know. Oh yeah, and and what a great guy too. Like you said, and it's nice. It's just nice interacting. Like I said, so many people have no, so many guys on the job have no really true idea of the connection between the dispatchers and, and the, and the guys working out in the field. But, but a lot of the dispatchers do a lot of the dispatchers know what's going on out of the field. Well, how, how important is that? Good dispatchers are, they're historical. It's historical. How important is that, John? How important is it to establish that relationship with your dispatch center, those that work there? And, and it was great. And I, and I always did that, you know, uh, when I was an officer in Brooklyn, the same thing happened. Uh, you get to know a couple of the dispatchers again, very, very well known dispatchers out there in Brooklyn, being into the job and turning companies out. And I mean, there was even there was even things that were going on um on the radio and you wouldn't know it if you weren't part of it. And I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Like in Brooklyn, if there was if there was something going on that the dispatcher wanted to let the rescue know to start heading towards without getting on the radio and saying it, because technically Maybe they hadn't reached that level yet where they could say, hey, rescue, start out for this box. There were certain things that they would say on the radio, like to the rescue, like, uh, you know, Brooklyn Rescue 2, Rescue 2, uh, uh, Disregard Rescue 2, Remain 10-8. And then, he would, and then right after that, he would say, uh, units responding to box uh, 2393, uh, you know, Sedgwick Avenue. That little series of words on the radio, the rescue officer would know what address he repeated after he said disregard rescue, he would notice not going towards that address. <laughs> well, it was almost like 
sort of like secret dispatching going on underneath underneath <laughs> the, the conscious level, you know? Oh, I, and it was just, like I said, some of the Brooklyn dispatches were, were historical, just like Manhattan, just like just like the Bronx. We get the beef, tree trio, tree trio. If, if you, you could just, I think you could probably type in Bronx dispatcher, the beef, you, and you probably could hear some of his transmissions. Well, there's, I believe, his, his video, John, is on YouTube of his, he retired, right? Oh yeah, he's and his his retirement, his last day. They have it on video on YouTube. Uh, the beef signs off, FDY, something like that, and it's pretty emotional. It. Everybody with their comments to him on the radio is pretty cool. And everybody knew him. And uh, I remember when they changed the dispatch numbers. At some point, they they changed the the dispatchers, you know, call out numbers. And he lost three trio somehow. I forget how that happened, but it was it was like heartbreaking, you know. But anyway. He's one of the well-known guys in the Bronx. I told you about Herbie uh, in, in Manhattan. Very, very well-known. Um, and, and you start – and guys would start to know their shifts. And, and as I said, they would look at the sheet. We have everything documented. I'm sure most other places do as well. The, the dispatcher, you know, 124, Herb Heiser in, in Manhattan, he could look up the whole borough of Manhattan and see what, what every deputy was working, what, every battalion chief's name. And if I was working, if somebody else was working, he would never use a first name for a chief. But, but he would use a rank – you know, like he'd say, rescue one, hey, Cap, uh, respond out to the lower east side, we got a job coming in. And he would just say that, and it would be the captain of rescue one that was working that day, you know, and, and the dispatcher knew it, you know. Um, sometimes you even hear guys hear back, uh, uh, rescue one, 10 4, thanks, Herbie, you know, and, and they would go. Obviously, if you did too much of that on the radio, there, there was something would be said, I guess. But all those little, just those little forays, those little, those little exceptions to the rule made it so personal. It was almost like, not almost like you did know the guy, you know. Well, and and you know they would like you said they'd slip you some 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 early uh, notifications I calls to give you a jump. How about the terminology? You know, I always I, you know like in Chicago for the longest time there was always when I when I was riding with Eddie Enright and and, and Ray Hoff and you know good friends and mentors and buddies and Ray was Ray was best man at my, my, Jamie and I's our wedding. Uh, his wife Barb was Jamie's uh, maid of honor, uh, but. Uh, that being said, you know, you'd, you'd hear they would, they would dispatch you, you know, and you'd, you'd be in route. You know, they, they, they back then with the Joker stand with, you know, the, you know, you hammer things on the, the speaker in the firehouse and you'd be in route and all, you, you know, he'd give you the rundown, you know, he'd, you know, main to battalion four to four battalion rundown. Go ahead. All right. You're getting the engine, engine, uh, you know, engine 18, engine this, that, tower there, this, blah, blah, blah. And they give the whole thing and he go, and then he would say, and were you sending you the squad and the command van? You know, the squad being the rescue, heavy rescue, the command van. And that told you, they said we're se- – or you're in route, they give you the rundown, they come back, man, in battalion, four, four, battalion, go ahead. All right, we're, we're sending the command van and the squad on this. And that automatically told you, you got a job. That they got right. enough – they had enough phone calls that he's like, send them the squad, send them the command van because they got a job. And you knew that. Yeah. And first of all, all, the buffs in the world that heard that, they're all zooming with their cars to get good pictures. But you knew yep. you had a job. <laughs> Now, in the FDNY, the dispatchers actually say the words, right? All of a sudden, they're like, uh, you know, Bronx to the one eight, go ahead. You're going to work. We're getting numerous calls. And then, and then, which was a really cool thing, a lot of them would do that differently. Are you going to work? Pull up your boots and stuff like that. But I had their own little terminology, which was fine. Again, it was a little stretch from strict department, you know, radio policy. But it was always allowed because it was seen as the guys are into it, right? But here's the cool thing. Bronx to the one eight, one eight. Hey, Chief, we're loading up the box. You, 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 you're going to work. you got a job. Numerous calls. I'm giving you four engines, three trucks, the squad, and a rescue. <laughs> so the dispatcher, and in the FDNY, the dispatchers are civilian radio operators. They are not firefighters. Some of them are firefighters at home and are volunteers. Some of them have kids on the job. Some of them brothers, dads, sisters on the job. But they, the civilian radio dispatcher, based on the calls that are coming in, based on the reports from the civilians, they, the civilian radio dispatcher, can bump the call up, give you a fourth engine, a third truck, a squad, and a rescue. Amazing. Amazing. You know, there's places that don't let their officers call for more units, never mind a dispatcher. And I got to tell you, I, and anybody who says they disagrees with this, is, is lying. I, many, many times, was uh, very happy with that. Not, not pulled out of the hole out of it, but the point is, many times that was very helpful. The fact that I get to this job, First engine gives a 1075, and it, it does nothing because the dispatcher already sent those units that were going to go on a 1075. And I've been to a lot of fires where that was materially assisted me 
the fact that those companies got in there faster and I get the squad and the rescue to come in earlier in the operation, maybe only a minute earlier, but a minute or two earlier is a lot when you're, you know, when you're fighting a fire. So that, that's pretty cool too, that the FDNY allows the dispatchers. They have, they have full official reign. They can bump a box up, not to another alarm, but they can load up a box on the initial alarm. Well, and I, and I did that when I got to Louisville, there was some hesitancy. Uh, I don't know why, maybe someone in the past said something, but I, I had meetings with the dispatchers up there and, and the comp center, John, I told him, I said, if you, if you, if you bump them out to a, to an automatic alarm and you start getting calls about smoke or you, or whatever, if you, if you start getting, I, I want you to feel free to, to take it from a single engine response to bump it to a full, you know, one alarm response. Don't, don't call the battalion. She just say, okay, well, you you know, I need to be able to trust you. And you, and, and I don't think they were ever given that trust before. And John, it was like, it was like, it was like, oh my God, the chains were off and they were just, they were doing incredible things. And they would, I said, look, I'll never, ever have an issue. It's like an officer. I've always told officers, I'll never have an issue. If you, if you go to a second alarm, and you didn't need one where I'll have an issue is if you didn't go to a second alarm, and you needed one. If you, you know, if, if, if you went to it and you didn't need it, Hey, we can always send them home. It's the other way around. We can't fix. And I wanted them to know, look, you can send an extra ambulance, get the chief going, whatever you got to do, feel free to do that. And Kelly, Kelly Haney was like that. She, you know, just like you said, they would tell, they give you the, the language. She would bump it up or, and, or she would say, guys, they go, guys, you got a good fire. Sounds like you had a good fire. I mean, and, you know, they're, again, they're getting enough calls there. And then, you know, or you'd hear, you know, Stan, Stan would do this. He would bump on. This is a Dallas thing, John. For our listeners, if you listen to Dallas on all the scanner apps, you'll hear them. You'll know when they have a job confirmed because you hear the tones, beep, boo, beep, boo, beep, boo. Let's roll, let's roll. Let's, let's roll, let's roll now. Let's roll them, let's roll them now. That, if you heard the one alarm tone Louisville and you heard Stan say, let's roll, let's roll, the one alarm structure, you knew you had a job. Got, you, you knew you had a job. The other thing too, John, you know, was the reports back to dispatch from like your aid, or in Chicago, same thing for the eight, or you hear Ray, you know, Battalion 4 to Maine, or you hear 271 to Maine, go ahead, it's a command van. Um, you know, the four battalions got, you know, three lines let out, tower ladder in the air, blah, 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 all this different stuff. You give the whole size of what they've got, you have a, a 400 by, by 300 one-story factory or, you know, warehouse or whatever. And then and then he would say, at the end, he'd say, there's going to be more on this office. And that, right, I mean, golly, that right there and then you knew within seconds, all right, if not a minute, boom, they're banging it to another alarm, you know, and, and all right. those little things. And, and so how important is it, though, again, for you to actually visit, either visit, the, I think it's important for firefighters to actually visit dispatch in Louisville, we get them, they, they tour it as new firefighters, and when you're on live duty, you have the opportunity to work it in order to save, save some of your sick time. But how important is it just for the battalions or you know, you know, I guess it's that face-to-face, -face, John, that connection with the voice or whatever. Um, I think it's important to go up there and see him at work. I mean, it's great. And I know if she, I know chiefs, uh, when chiefs get trained, when you're a captain, you make battalion chief. There's usually a big class, 10, 15 people, 18 people get promoted. One, one of the couple of days that they do some training, they, they do go up to the dispatch office and they sit down and they, they look at the different stations as the call receivers, the people that are, you know, answering the calls. Then there's a decision dispatcher that gets all that information from the call takers, you know, and that goes to them. And then they're the ones that, you know, pretty much punch out the box. And then, then there's a, a different, different guy actually on the microphone. And there's just one, there's just one guy on a microphone in Manhattan, one guy on a microphone in Brooklyn that for, for, the, for those of you listening, obviously New York city, five separate boroughs, five separate radio frequencies. So it's the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. So it's rescue, you know, rescue one to Manhattan, rescue two to Brooklyn. And if you're in the Bronx and you work in the Bronx for your whole 20 years, you'll never hear a, a Manhattan radio dispatcher or a Brooklyn radio dispatcher. Everyone's got their own, their own frequency, their own CO, their own communications office. They're trying to, con they're trying to condense them now. They're trying to put, you know, two or three together here and there. I'm not quite sure why it worked out great the way they originally designed it. But, but the point is that the, the, uh, the chiefs would get assigned during their promotion training to go to the dispatch office and, and actually walk through, spend the day there and look at the different stations and see how the calls come in, see how they're assigned, see how the, uh, you know, how the decision dispatcher decides who's going on the box and, and how the actual dispatcher that's on the radio receives the calls. And like I said, there's just one guy. Sometimes it's amazing. The whole Burma had many, many, many companies and they're all talking just to one microphone. There's not a series of people there, which is, which is pretty interesting, you know? 
Well, and the other thing too is the dispatchers, the alarm operators' knowledge of the city is phenomenal in a lot of cases. And I remember, I remember standing in the in, in the main alarm office in Chicago with Ray, and um, and and we were down there. He was he was working at a different battalion, but we're down there and they're bumping out calls and they're talking about. Yeah, they would dispatch a call and go, yeah, that's the corner of such and such and such and such. And yeah, there's a there's a three story frame, got, got a little uh, mom and pop store in the bay, you know. And they and they knew, they knew the neighborhoods. They knew um, that the, they could describe buildings for you. They knew intersections so well. They knew the, they knew when rigs were they they could they could almost tell you they're going to be pulling up any second now. They, the, the response times and their knowledge of it were incredible. In fact, in New York City. Weren't there times that they could tell you on the radio, look out for another company coming or whatever? Weren't there census instances? Like- yeah, that's a great story. It was, it was in Brooklyn. And, and so, somebody, I mean, it happened to me as well, but somebody's going through a fire down Metropolitan Avenue screaming, you know, hey, you know, Brooklyn Engine uh, 209, who's now closed. The Brooklyn Engine 209, 209, where you at? Metropolitan Avenue heading towards, you know, Kosciuszko. Uh, 10 4, uh, slow down when you get to 107th Street. Uh, there's another box out. You 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 may meet uh, you know 290 engine. You know, officer tells the chauffeur who's screaming along now, right? Ten blocks away, guy slow down, Billy. We're we're approaching that intersection. They slow down, and sure enough, another rig goes screaming across. Not another rig. The rig that the dispatcher said you may meet at that intersection. He knew it. He knew there were two boxes out. He knew that this company was going that way, and there was another company going the other direction. And they might meet each other at that box. And sure enough, they did. Not at the box, but at, the, at that intersection. Talk about insight. Talk about understanding where companies are, where they're responding from, where they're going to, what the timing is. Just amazing. And, and, and I'll tell you another funny story. And I remember this one happened. When I was in 11 truck a long time ago on the Lower East Side. We were responding into Brooklyn. We relocated to 108 truck, which was, you know, over, over the either Manhattan or the Brooklyn Bridge and into, into Brooklyn a little bit. Not too far. But, but we were very unfamiliar with that area. We rarely went into Brooklyn. Rarely. The, I mean, the East River is there. It was like a wall. The, you know, you, Brooklyn had plenty of companies. Manhattan had plenty of companies. Rarely did you go across the, uh, the river. But anyway, so we went across. And I remember sitting back there and listening to the radio. And it was like, ladder 1-1, one, one, you know, acting 108 to Brooklyn. Go ahead. Uh, we're on your frequency, Brooklyn. Uh, we're just coming off the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you know, where do we go? You know what I'm saying? He said, okay, go, go down Flatbush. Uh, 11 truck, go down Flatbush. When you, when you get to uh, uh, the McDonald's, there's a McDonald's on the corner. M- make the left at that corner. That's 107th Street. Go, go down about four blocks. You're going to get the uh, Mulcahy's Irish Pub is going to be on the right-hand side. <laughs> make a right. That's Avenue B. Go down about six blocks. When you get to St. Brendan's Church, it's, it's the building right across the street from St. Brendan's Church. And, of course, it was always bars and churches and everything else that they knew about. But <laughs> there they are, giving directions. A guy from the radio dispatch giving directions to a company traveling down the road on how to get to a firehouse by, by, by landmark, not even necessarily by street name. You know, I just thought it was pretty cool. Oh, the, their, their knowledge base of the city. And, again, you know, I think where this started to, 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 to lapse a little bit is the more we got into the CAD systems, um, you know, at times I used to say, I, I, and I know, I know for a fact there are some great systems out there. Computer aid dispatch is huge, and it's going to help you do your job quicker and better and more efficiently and all that stuff. But you still have to have the knowledge of the streets. You still have to know where the firehouses are. You still have, you know, I just, and, and I saw for a little bit, John, um, and especially Louisville, where that kind of, started to go away and it was it was more about just push the buttons whatever CAD recommends there was time CAD would make a recommendation I'll just say that wasn't right or wasn't it wasn't the closest you whatever and and some of the older dispatchers were able to, to kind of wrangle that in and go no no override it override yeah, not, it yeah. exactly not only do we need to know our and God bless the CAD systems that we have now you know, not only do we need to know that backwards and forwards, but you still need to know that map. You still need to know those units, those firehouses, where they're coming from. That here's our big hospital. The ambulance is just leaving there. That you know, and again, w- w- whether you're watching your lo- street locators, your unit locators to see where they're at or not, or CAD's going to recommend the the closest. Unit. I mean, just knowing, you know. And I've said this: what happens if you, if CAD shuts down? You know, I, I saw, I've seen that happen where I, and I had a really a newer dispatcher. She's one of the more seniors now. She's awesome. She was sitting there. She, and we, we actually had to, we had to set up our, we lost power to dispatch center. It was amazing. It's a gigantic dispatch center. 
But our major, our big command van, John, our big, we had, you know, five different systems in their radios and we just, boom, turn it up and boom. We, we, so they were able to get 911 going through another dispatch center and the phones. And they came over and they dispatched from right next door from our gigantic command unit. I remember her sitting and she said, she was kind of bouncing with her hands going, I don't hit my computer screen in front of me. And I said, okay, because it was like a burglary in progress. And I said, okay, so do this, just do this. Like we did in the old days. Any unit in the area of the, of the Hampton and burglary in progress, big, 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 three different units popped up. And I said, there you go. Assign them, give them the information and just write that. And, and, and the, it was like this moment where she became a huge advocate for not only knowing the CAD system, John, but knowing how to do it old school, right? How to, how to, you know, how to, how to call an audible when you need to, because not yeah. everybody, we know technology is great, but technology could hurt you too at the same time, right? Now, now, you know, the FDNY, I think they do it now. Dispatchers, when they get hired, have to ride with companies for a while to see what company's doing, what an engine is and a truck is. Oh, and, that's awesome. You know, every dispatcher doesn't have a kid on the job, and every dispatcher isn't a volley back home. That's so awesome. that's good because at, at one point in the job, we had a couple of dispatchers that got on, and, and they were good, and they knew what they were doing. Maybe they weren't good, but they were, they were efficient. They, they could get the job done. But they just knew that there was three E's and two L's on every box. They didn't really know. They couldn't pick an engine out of a parking lot. But they knew on the dispatch screen, E21, E34, E44, okay, I got my three E's and two L's, L16 and L17. There's my, my two L's and my three E's on a box. They knew they had to have three E's and two L's. They had no idea what a ladder was. They couldn't pick one out. Now, that's scary to us. And in the end, it didn't really make a difference because the dispatcher still had to make sure. But, gosh, you can see the difference when somebody on the other oh. side of that microphone really does know what an engine or a truck is or does, really knows. Even the dispatchers in, in my job, and every engine is something other than an engine. Some engines oh. are CFRD engines. Some engines are command post companies. They, they go to a high-rise, and they run the elevators and the radio system, a uh, high-rise fire. Some, out, some engines are foam engines. Some engines are are uh, uh, hardwire radio communication engines. So a dispatcher that knows that, can, he'll, just, he'll just call them out. He'll just say, you yeah, Manhattan engine 4-4, four, four, 44 engine. Start out for that second alarm downtown Manhattan. I'll get back to you in a minute. Because he knew that 44 was one of the things that was required on that box. And the engine that was on the CAD wasn't available to do it. Oh, I think that is, and I'm glad you brought that up because that is so huge. Get, get the alarm off, just like it is to get firefighters through dispatch. You know, having the dispatchers ride out, if you can pull it off. I know a lot of places for our listeners have a hard time with that because of staffing. But I remember Kelly, and I, I mentioned Kelly earlier, Kelly Haney. I remember, John, the first time she rode out, she, she's on the apparatus floor, and they dispatch a call. She, goes, she heard the speakers, and she goes, how the hell do you hear what we're saying out here with the engine running? And I go, see, that's sometimes why they need to get in the rig and say, can you give me the address again or confirm or are my CAD's down or my computer, her, their computer's rebooting or whatever. And just like they, the firefighters need to go up in the nerve center because that is one of the most stressful jobs in the world is, is when it is happening, it is going down is, oh my God. It's, so same, same. I thought that was, that's a great point of having them come out and spend just a little bit of time seeing what it's like, seeing what, I know my wife, Jamie, working for Wichita County Sheriff here, the, the first time she went out rolling with one of the deputies, he's like, all right, he pulls up, he goes, she goes, oh, this is the, uh, I don't know, I'll make up a name, the electronic cowboy bar. Oh, this is where, okay, now. Right, oh, right. This is, oh, gee, okay, now, oh, okay. And, and everything, and like I said before, as important as for them to put a face with the name when they can, especially with the Chiefs, you know. So so you were saying a minute ago about, uh, we were talking about the importance, you know, uh, and I want to go back to this, of, of you know, putting a face with the name and knowing your dispatchers and, and all that and everything. Um, you, you, you You've talked before about, um, going up and taking care of dispatch, maybe bringing some treats or something like that. I know bringing, bringing ice cream up there or some, some, some cookies in that was a big deal for them. I mean, you know, because everybody forgets about them sometimes, right? Oh, absolutely. Like I said, they're, they're pretty invisible to most people unless you know dispatchers or unless they're in your, in your area. A lot of the chiefs get to know the dispatchers because you end up talking them on the phone sometimes afterwards or whatever. But we'd go up there occasionally, and like you said, we'd bring a box of cookies or a cake or something because they were in a – in our neighborhood, not too far away. And, and Jack and I were there one day and, you know, hanging out with them, talking, showing. And then we left. We got out to the car, started the car up. And all of a sudden, on the handy talkie, 
Now they have a big super handy talkie up there, like microphone power handy talkie, even though it's just all of a sudden Bronx to the one eight, not on the department radio, but I'm on my handy talkie. Yeah, go ahead. Make a left and start down towards uh, Pomeroy. It sounds like you got a work. It sounds like you got a job. Boom. We took off. We were the first one in there. It was a 1075 in a frame. I transmitted 1075. I transmitted the second alarm. I transmitted a third alarm as a battalion chief. Why? Because we got there so early and the fire was roaring and it was getting into both exposures. And Jack went around the back and said, hey, chief, it's in exposure four. I had fire in three buildings before the first company got there. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. But again, why? Because the dispatchers are on top of their game. And the minute the call started to come in, somebody said, oh, sounds like we're going to get a job on Pomeroy. He got on that handy talkie. He knew we had just left. And he knew we were still in the neighborhood. He got me on the handy talkie. Make a left, chief. Start down towards Pomeroy. you got a job. You know? And boy, oh, boy. And those little things matter when they get you out there, out the door faster or when they take you off something, right? All of a sudden, you're heading somewhere. And I've had that happen. Rods to the one eight. Go ahead. Uh, what do you got at that box? Uh, we're still checking it. We, we, it smells like we got food. All right, I got a job coming in. Can can I have the rescue? Ten four. Take the rescue. So the rescue was at the box for whatever reason. And he gets on the radio and just asks me, "I got a job coming in. Can I take the rescue? You got him. Take him." And if I said no, it would be no. And he sent another rescue there. You know, but but it was cool that they felt the ability to do that. To just casually talk to the chiefs about stuff well, like that. I love the, you know, like we, the fact you, you emphasize, and I emphasize it earlier, the importance of that dispatch alarm operator, kind of that little guardian angel sitting on your shoulder. I mentioned when we let in, John, there are firefighters alive today because, you know, an incident commander missed. And it's, it, we know this. It's possible to miss a mayday or miss a call for help or something. You know, and we've got the tapes to play it back where you go, you hear, you hear, you know, dispatch command, go ahead. Uh, Chief, I, I just heard a mayday, or I heard this, or I heard that, or they'll tell you, you know, uh, engine 161's uh, driver's emergency button's going off, or whatever. And, and, and all of a sudden now, that just right there, bing, bing, you find out you got a guy who's missing, the mayday, all this different stuff, and we find him, we locate him, or we rescue him for a fact. It is a fact. There are firefighters alive today because of dispatch. And I, think, and, I just think that's incredible. And I'll tell you what, uh, on that point, uh, I know we're getting close to finishing up here, but I want to mention another point. FDNY, it's, a, it, it's old news now, but it, I remember when it happened, we started recording. They started capturing all the handy talkie transmissions, meaning the fire ground radio transmissions, which are still, you can get them now because of the technology. I think you can listen in on even the radio frequencies on, you know, at the fire ground. But years ago, you couldn't do that. They're just, they're just fire ground radios. They just talk point to point, radio to radio. The dispatcher doesn't even hear it. The dispatcher hears the department radio, but they don't hear the handy talking stuff at the fire. So most of the time, it was lost forever. And then they started putting recorders in the battalion chief's cars. Actually, the, uh, the, the, one of the fires where a bunch of guys got killed, there happened to be a safety battalion there with the recorder. Might have been a Black Sunday fire. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's, it's job-wide now. Every battalion car in the FDNY has a recorder now. So sometimes, not sometimes, Anytime there's a serious injury or a firefighter death or a gigantic fire, they can capture all of that. Now, it automatically gets, gets dispatched. Automatically, all the radio transmission is captured by the battalion car. When you're back into quarters, it passively downloads into a receiver right on the wall and goes down to headquarters. They actually have an office down there where all the radio transmissions are constantly flowing in and being recorded and documented and timestamped. And there's actually people working there. A lieutenant from my firehouse used to work there for a while on light duty. And I'd come into work, and, and, and he'd have my last two jobs on CD in my drawer and be able to listen to them. Or you can request them. If you have a job, you can say, can I get a copy of the audio for the uh, second alarm last week? You got it, Chief. Next time you come into work, there's a CD in your drawer with that whole transmission on there, with the whole 20, 30-minute long fire. So now they can listen to fatal fires and where there's accidents and injuries and find out who said what and when they said it and how long it was between transmissions. Very, very helpful to, you know, for training. And for investigations, well, interesting thing. And as, as we kind of close things out here, how, I mean, I, I've said this for years and I'll ask you this and, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of things before you answer, but about how important it is to take care of dispatch. We've been talking about the importance of the alarm office, getting to know your alarm operators, you know, having them get to know you, you know, having firefighters visit the alarm office, the dispatch center, see what goes on there, having dispatchers ride out with you, never forgetting you know, that, that April is always National Public Safety Telecommunicators Month with the week, 
the week and that week. And we used to always celebrate that, John, by, you know, Daryl or Terry would bring over, oh, my God. A, he would, and they, we, we screwed up the first year because they brought over a gigantic basket of treats and snacks and cookies and fruits and all kinds of things. Well, the other two shifts didn't get it, or they got, like, what was left. So then they, had to, they would go back, and, and Daryl was great. Daryl Brown was great at this, and Terry, Terry McGrath, my partner, was. They'd go back at each shift. Even at 11, when the 11 o'clock shift came on, they were standing there with a whole other basket, a whole other round. And we'd buy them nice. shirts or jackets or sweatshirts or things. You know, and when it was really blazing hot in August and we're, we're just, the alarm office is going crazy, someone would sneak up there with some bluebell ice cream for them and just – you know, they tend to, we tend to forget about them a lot, buddy. And, 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 you know, it's, and I want to mention this, the whole mental health awareness thing, you know, we're all so quick as chiefs, especially now that we finally recognize the fact that it's okay to not be okay. And to get your guys and gals help when you, when, when, you know, when, when they need it. And, and we'll talk to you, how many times you hear this, like we're, they're sitting there going, you know, well, we had a really bad call. This happened, this happened, this or whatever, or firefighter line of duty after whatever. We had the diffusing, then we had a debriefing, and you know, put all our firefighters through it. And my question has been, so what did you do for dispatch? They were the yeah. one on the other end of the council talked to that firefighter. They sent, I know one dispatcher that quit. She quit after a firefighter got killed, a lieutenant in a house fire. They were, you know, they knew each other because he was out of the same station where dispatch was, and just felt, there was just this, horrible feeling that, you know, she couldn't get over. I sent him there kind of thing. And I know right. people say, Oh, get over it. Well, you, you know what? You don't understand it then. And, right. and, and they were the ones with the little babies and people screaming on the phone. How about they're talking to someone on the phone that's trapped in their burning house that can't get out and they're gasping for air and they're telling them to hang on. And they got on the phone with them till you've heard the tapes till they, you know, they can't hear or they hear the gurgling. I mean, there's a, and we forget we forget, and I'm just saying this to the fire chiefs out there, don't forget your dispatchers when it comes to diffusing or debriefing or making sure you take care of them because there's a ton of stress that goes on up there. Um, yep. when it comes to, but, but so, John, as we finish things out, how important is it to take care of dispatch and recognize who you got up there watching over you? I mean, it is important. And certainly most ordinary fire, firefighters, fire companies, fire chiefs, you know, just visit them, stopping by, saying hello, giving them a call once in a while is nice, or getting to know them is nice. Um, but the fire chief, the fire department should pay attention to those folks and make sure that they get they get their due. You know what I'm saying? Make sure they get treated well and not just they're not just relegated to the back room and the CO and the dispatch center and you know, like some second class citizen, which which they're not. They're a very, very integral part of the whole fire service delivery system. And most people just know them as a voice on the radio. You know, that's why. So it's it's interesting. But before we go, I want to do a shout out to Warren Fuchs, who was, who was my, you know, my man in Brooklyn. He was great. He was a great dispatcher. He came to my last night in the firehouse. He was there with you. Well, they and, come uh, on, right? And, of course, uh, 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 Isa, uh, Herbie Isa in Manhattan and the Beef in the Bronx. Three great dispatchers that I knew very well my whole time on a job and worked in different boroughs and got to know them. They were great, great guys, you know. Well, now, and they called uh, Warren, was his nickname Fa? Fa? What they call they he had a nickname. What is his base his last name? They call him you know what? I don't know. I don't know. I always called him Warren, and he was he was one two zero, one twenty truck. He was one two zero in in Brooklyn. You know, we, everybody had their own numbers. We had him. We had him. Remember, years and years ago, we had him on one of our command post shows of fire engineering, and he talked about the uh, the the, uh, the 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 power outage. You know, um, in the city he was working black for. Out. Yeah, the blackout. Black oh my god. But yeah, great, great. Hey, I'm glad you did that because I got, I got to talk about you know I, m- I mentioned Kelly, you know Felicity, Angela, Stan, and all the other. There's been some great, Gwen, great dispatchers up there, and that we've worked at a lot of great ones in, in the city of Chicago and the suburbs there. Um, but that's it. Hey, great, great show talking about the alarm Absolutely. office, the, the nerve yep. center, those that have our backs, uh, buddy. Uh, if they want, and I always ask you this, but you know, so we can repeat it. But the best way for someone to get a hold of you. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. We appreciate you joining us again. Spread the word. Tell those to subscribe on iTunes or go to my YouTube channel for those that uh, don't do iTunes, and, and we'll get the information out to you. We appreciate you. We end all of our shows. We ask you to please keep the men and women in the armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means never forgetting. Thank you. God bless you. Be safe out there.